Good morning, everyone. And seriously, it's great to see so many familiar faces and for you all taking the time today. And I know everyone leads very busy lives to kind of contribute and learn uh, a little bit more about what we're doing at the Commission and also hearing from some experts. At, at a bit of a discussion at the Commission recently, we, we kind of, like Diane said, we wondered, you know, when things go bad, who's to blame? Whose fault really is it? Um, I too have a bit of fear around KiwiSaver, given how the markets have been and the regular contributions have kind of, uh, if you like, covered some of the highs and lows or the volatility or the ups and downs of balances. But we could be leading into a perfect storm where share market goes down and interest rates go up. And then we've got to think about, well, who is to blame uh, when uh, the consumer rings up and says, well, this is not what I expected. It's not what I wanted. And we've got four wonderful experts here today that I want to uh, introduce to you. And they're going to give you a perspective or a view in each of the areas of field of expertise and also hopefully create a little bit of debate and discussion around whose fault really it is and what we need to do to improve it. So speaking on behalf of the consumer, we've got P Professor Elaine Kepson who will tell us whether they're innocent bystanders, this is the consumer, who need protecting or whether they're guilty of making bad decisions and seriously should be taking more responsibility for their actions. We have Miles Larby from, uh, uh, and he's a senior exec and, in financial literacy at ASIC. He will help us understand whether his experience, particularly in Australia, whether the market should be better regulated to safeguard the consumer, or whether maybe too many regulations stifle business and opportunity and access for, for uh, investors to, to, uh, to go into products. Then we've got um, Blair Vernon, Director of Vice and Sales at AMP. Now Blair is going to take the view from a provider's perspective. Are they creating the right products? Are they giving the right advice? Or are they just trying to sell stuff to you? And, and maybe, uh, depending on the environment, whether it's an appropriate way or not, and what, what they should be thinking about. And then you could argue, well, actually, none of that's relevant because the economy is the driving uh, background to all of this, and it doesn't matter what you do, whether you regulate it and form and uh, provide information to consumers. If the economy is uh, not going well, it's not going to matter anyway. And we've got uh, Shimabil Ikwa, principal economist here. He's going to talk and tell us whether n none of this really matters. And I wonder, uh, to kick things off, Elaine, would you... Just give us five minutes, kind of your view uh, from a consumer's perspective. Hmm. Well, I don't think we should load everything onto the consumer. It's not always their fault. And I, I think one of the things that really dismayed me was after the US subprime market, so many people were saying, if only the, uh, the crash rather, so many people were saying, if only the consumers had behaved more responsibly, mm -hmm. this would never have happened. In my view, had the market been properly regulated, or actually indeed regulated at all, because financial advisors were totally unregulated and anybody could set up to sell subprime mortgages. Had the design of those products been more responsible, they, the ones being sold all had two or three uh, drastically reduced interest rates with the idea that when you came to the end of the two or three years, you'd simply remortgage. So if you were on a low income, you could have constantly afford a very high mortgage. Had governments made available social housing, none of those families would have bought. So to say that had we educated those people better, it wouldn't have happened, I think is totally unrealistic. Miles, what are your thoughts from, uh, from the a regulatory environment? What are the things that we need to be mindful of? Um, yeah, thanks, David. I mean, I think um, um, as the sort of conduct regulator in Australia, um, our focus is, of course, trying to strike the right balance between free market-based uh, system where people have choice about financial products and services um, and the appropriate degree of investor and consumer trust and confidence, I suppose. Um, we have you know, a very comprehensive system of financial services regulation in Australia, um, and nonetheless, it's a very open system. Um, we uh, are trying to not necessarily uh, always ask for more regulations. Um, sometimes there is a need for, and we've seen some examples of this which I can talk to later, sort of targeted regulation in respect of specific products. But we're trying to, I suppose, influence um, more 
the conduct and culture within uh, financial services institutions. Um, and that's certainly something that our commissioners at ASIC, our chairman, has been talking about a lot lately, that ASIC really will be focusing much more on, on culture and cultural practices within firms. Very good. Claire, what are your kind of views from a provider perspective? And the providers. Um, <laughs> well, I think if you look at you know, the recent history of New Zealand, it would be unrealistic to say that there's uh, not some challenge with some providers. Um, the, the question is, uh, in any market, there's always going to be a broad spectrum of, of provider quality uh, and calibre. And I think uh, the work now of the FMA uh, to uh, improve that it goes a long way to, to address you know, those, those fringe elements. Um, but undoubtedly, uh, I think the comment's absolutely correct, um, the culture within those organisations is going to be fundamental because there's only so much a regulator can do. Uh, I think the comment Alfred made, the, the question of um, charisma versus character is fundamental. Uh, so, uh, and there's a part of that for organisations who are providing services in this market in terms of product. Uh, there's also a question of um, to what extent are they pushing product or are they also supporting that with advice? Uh, because uh, that has to go hand in hand, good quality advice, uh, in order to help consumers um, with a degree of you know, credibility. So providers absolutely have a, a key role to play and need to shoulder some accountability when things don't go wrong if they have in fact you know, been found to, to take what I think are often uh, incentivised shortcuts if the culture is not right. Makes sense. Show me, Bill, what are your thoughts around the economy? <coughs> how, how does that impact it? I think in some ways the question is wrong. It's not who do you blame, but what do you do when something goes wrong? Mm. And we know that the economy is incredibly important and the ups and downs have a huge impact in terms of asset markets, returns, your asset allocation, and all those kinds of things. But the fact of the matter is, as in investors and even market participants, we have very little control of what's happening in the economy. Now, as you would have seen from economists' forecasts, we get everything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but you're consistent. Uh, we are consistently Good. wrong, yeah. but um, you can't always take the opposite direction because we all cover our bits and we all have different views. <laughs> so when I think about what happens in the economy, and I was watching the news last night and I was watching the queues of pensioners in Greece, mm -hmm. yes, there are lots of economic issues that can have a really big and overwhelming impact, but that's what makes it really important to have very well-educated consumers. That's why it's important to have good regulation, and that's why it's critical to have good conduct in the markets. The necessity comes from the fact that we have no control over the economy, and this is the matrix of control versus impact. Very high impact, zero control. And the things that we have to look at are the things that we can control so then we can manage the risks that come, come from elsewhere. That's, that's a pretty good way to put it, to be fair. It's a bit of a balance of everything, a combination of responsibility. I wonder though, and you know, it probably isn't the right question, but it's a question that consumers do come back with, who they want to be disappointed with, or they've been misled, or they, they didn't understand, or they, they may have done at the time, but their memories were short. I wonder, Elaine, from your perspective, uh, what kind of protection do you think consumers really, really genuinely need for those that it's, it's not their top of mind stuff that they think about every day? And by that you mean in the marketplace? Yeah. buying financial products. Um, I think they need, uh, certainly need regulators to be keeping a close eye on what's happening in the marketplace. I think uh, our UK regulator acted too slowly and uh, too mildly in response to the payment protection insurance scandal. So I think they need regulators to ensure that inappropriate products are not sold um, on the marketplace, that even the appropriate products are not missold to inappropriate people. I think they also need um, an independent source of arbitration. I was for six years a non-executive director on the Financial Ombudsman Service Board in the UK, and some of you will know that is a very big business in the UK. Um, it now has 2,000 staff, so it's a very, very large organization. I think consumers do need that to help them get redressed when things go wrong. And I think they also need good targeted information they can use to try and wrest some of the control away. And I suppose the last thing I think they need is 
um, good independent financial advice, and that's in very short supply. Mm -hmm. Most of it is tied up with sales, most of it is incentivized sales, and the work of our regulator and a number of other regulators in Europe shows that there is definitely a bias when uh, staff are incentivized to sell, incentivized differently for different products. So I think uh, the Netherlands was quite brave. It went down the route first of declaring that all advice should be truly independent and whole of market and should not be um, associated with sales. If it was, it sh should not call itself advice. UK has followed the same path and everybody's waiting to see whether that means a drastic reduction in advice. My own personal view is that a reduction is better than having something which purports to be what it isn't and therefore dupes consumers. Sure. Yeah, I think when you're thinking about regulation, I wonder, Miles, your thoughts on this, and then we'll get Blair's, because um, you can regulate and continue to regulate and try and continue to protect the consumer's interest. But does that also maybe perhaps stop innovation, uh, accessibility, and for the general public to understand what the investment choices are? I mean, what are your thoughts on getting that kind of balance mm. right? Well, I mean, it is absolutely a balance. I mean, too much regulation can can have that um, adverse impact of stifling innovation, and certainly that's uh, not what we want to do. Um, as I say, this is a very pertinent sort of discussion, debate, so we're having similar ones in Australia. We've just had a financial system inquiry, for example, that's reviewed the entire Australian financial system, including the regulatory structures, um, and has proposed a number of very interesting uh, things for, for further sort of thought and contemplation. And um, many of the things that Elaine has, has just articulated are outlined as sort of key principles of a, of a uh, consumer protection regime. Although the inquiry did say, if you get these things right, then you should be able to say the consumer should take responsibility for their decision. Um, what it also went on to sort of put forward, which I think is interesting, was uh, something that would be new in Australia, but I know in other jurisdictions they, they, they're working with this, is a product intervention power, um, some responsibilities around the design and distribution of products and a power for the regulator to um, take action um, in cases where inappropriate products are being sold inappropriately or, or, or whatever. Um, that's something that's just out there sort of um, for further debate and, and the government is considering that. But I think it is a very interesting um, um, sort of new direction potentially. Um, I think, uh, as I said, um, we do have some examples of particularly targeted regulation in response to problems that have come up in the market. So, um, for example, in Australia, we have now, under our uh, new financial advice regime, a ban on conflicted remuneration um, um, and also a new statutory best interest duty. In our uh, mm -hmm. consumer credit space, we have specific obligations on providers to ensure that the loan that they're writing for a customer meets their requirements and is, is not unsuitable and the customer can actually repay it uh, without financial hardship. So these are areas where um, um, you, know, you could say at the expense of sort of completely free reign innovation of products, regulation has come in to sort of um, control some of the potentially adverse um, impacts. More generally I suppose, like I said, um, where our focus is on an ASIC is not uh, I mean, we don't make regulations, that's for the government to do. But one of the, the, the sort of the lens that we're trying to look through in terms of our enforcement work and our surveillance work is, is this focus on culture. Um, so um, we've done, uh, so what ASIC is doing is building um, a review or an assessment of culture. And we've made some statements about what we think good culture is and how it should be sort of um, implemented. Um, but we will be building uh, an assessment of culture into our surveillance work, our proactive and reactive state, uh, uh, surveillance work. We'll also be making a lot more statements, I think, about what we think are examples of bad culture and what we think our, uh, good culture looks like, and providing guidance to industry that way. Um, so that's a, while I mean, you know, that's sort of always sort of underpinning um, conduct in the financial services industry, this sort of very much more sort of clear articulation of it, I think is something quite new for, for us as a regulator, or, or it's certainly a new level of emphasis. And I think that is in response to a lot of the uh, lessons from the GFC and a lot of lessons from some of the issues we've had in Australia around the financial advice sector, uh, conflicted, um, you know, the impact of incentives, um, 
difficulty with um, what we call bad apples sort of uh, moving through the system. So, so there's always going to be bad apples. It just it, it, That's always going to happen, though, I guess, finding a way to mitigate that and at least raising the awareness of what yeah. to look out for, scams, kind of things like that. Mm -hmm. There are going to be characteristics that we should be able to communicate effectively mm -hmm. to, in our case, New Zealanders, saying if, if it doesn't tick all these boxes, then actually it might not be as good as it sounds. There, I wonder, you're talking about culture, because it, it was a great point that Miles talked about. Uh, you know, the culture and distribution of um, selling of financial services, it, it's kind of going through a bit of a revolution at the moment. And what are your thoughts and views around how uh, you can help the consumer through the process, of course, while also trying to grow and manage a business? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I think um, Elaine's point about um, uh, better to have um, a lack of access to advice than have uh, stuff that is actually pretending to be advice but is not, I think is a absolutely fair. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a challenge uh, in, in many markets. I think this one is, is similar. Um, what I see, though, is a great challenge if you're in the, if you're in the business of uh, financial services is, is kind of a dichotomy. There's a, there's a bunch of products that people come in and are pretty keen to buy um, and they are generally debt products because we've got a, a consumption-based economy. Uh, you know, loads of kids coming out of school, one of the easiest products to access is a great big student loan. So, you know, we've got a big $14 billion debt, so they learn pretty easy. Yep. And so uh, that, along with a whole lot of messages, means there's a lot of buy demand for that stuff. Um, correspondingly, there's very little interest in stuff that is investment uh, or protection-related. Um, I find, fascinatingly, when I listen to conversations that my team have, people who ring up are more worried about the, whether the cover on their car insurance covers their mag wheels and their stereo than they are about their life insurance or their retirement savings. That's just the inverse nature of it. So, so how do you deliver advice that, um, that quells the insatiable demand to buy a bunch, to get the product you've got because they just want to buy the car or the house or whatever else, and try and actually slow that, uh, that metabolic rate down to get people to take some time to consider the other elements that are going on. That's actually an incredibly hard thing to do because you've got advisors who are trying to intercept very serious cultural signals um, that are much bigger than just financial services. Um, so that requires, you know, to be frank, quite a degree of courage to, to get people to face into that conversation. Um, the, the other thing that's interesting is I find with the advice industry is most advisors have had to, uh, that have succeeded in this industry um, have, and look, we all can talk about the odd bad apple, but for the main, a lot of them face a great challenge, which is if they sit down and do a decent piece of advice with, it, with many New Zealanders, I would suggest most, unfortunately they always deliver bad news because for the most part, people are not financially organised. So the job of being an advisor, if you're a good one, is actually to be a deliverer of bad news to people. And most people don't actually want to have that conversation. <laughs> so, you know, the guy behind me here is a hairdresser. Most people would spend much more time at the hair salon in any given year and more money than they will on procuring financial advice and actually having that conversation. That's just the reality. Yeah, I don't know why you're life. looking at me when you say that, to be fair. <laughs> Uh, but I, I do use that a bit too because I think in New Zealand we, um, when it comes to advice we do seem to be tied up in two coats of paint when we want to spend or, or get some advice around that. But um, probably just before we get into the advice thing because I think that's a really interesting area that we can kind of explore a bit further mm -hmm. with the panellists. Shimmy Bill, you, you raised some, some really good points. I mean you talked about how um, New Zealanders need to understand economies better, or at least the markets, so that they can perhaps make better informed decisions. I mean, how would you see your role, or, or I guess the industry's role, to kind of help improve that? Yeah, so I guess when I was speaking about the role of the economy, I was less worried about people's understanding of the economy per se. Um, it's not necessary for everybody to, ex to be an expert on the economy, because I'd be out of a job. Um, <laughs> and there's plenty of them. <laughs> yeah, there are far too many of us around as it is. <laughs> Um, it's more about understanding how to ask the right questions and to know, to know that um, you know, your life stages, about the issue, the broad concepts of portfolio constructions, about um, you know, diversification that Rob talked about. Um, 
you know, I myself don't do my investments directly. I have an advisor who does it for me, mm -hmm. but I trust him to be able to make the right decisions by asking him a hell of a lot of questions. I could imagine with my uh, <laughs> economic hat on, it would be quite a, I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that. Yeah, and our meetings tend to be quite long. <laughs> I hope he's not getting, you're not paying mm -hmm. by the hour. Well, <laughs> he gets paid as, as per the industry structure. <laughs> now, <laughs> <laughs> now, when I think about my personal perspective, um, you know, the poor guy has to sit in front of two economists who grills him on every single investment decision. Now, we're in the fortunate, fortunate situation where we have the knowledge and skill to be able to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. But we also believe that there are sufficient safeguards in place within our financial advisor, uh, in the organization that he works, and the market that he operates in, that we should be able to get a reasonably good and safe outcome. Now, I have to have that faith, otherwise I will not invest in certain markets. And that's exactly what we do. We don't invest in every international market, for example. So when I talk about um, an understanding and an appreciation, this is not about the breadth of everything, but just having sufficient knowledge to be able to go to the right place for the right questions. And like you say, you have to be willing to pay for advice. Yeah. Unfortunately, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Yeah, no, I think that's, like, that's a very good point. And um, I think if we look at where, and of course in New Zealand we are going through um, Financial Advisor Act review right now, um, and it's actually quite timely given perhaps where you can and are able to get advice. There's, it seems to be less advisors, not more. And then more effectively, how people know where to go to get it. Um, Shimbu, well, while, while you're talking about that, I wonder from your perspective, uh, and you use a financial planner, which is fantastic, what do you think needs to happen to lift the profession and the ethical standards of advisors in New Zealand? I think we're well on the path to that already. So the changes in regulations we've had with the AFA regime and things like that, are very much a step in the right direction. But this is about moving to a different state and it's gonna take time. Yep. We can't expect the old dog to learn new tricks. And you know, I know a lot of people in the financial advisory community, some of them are fantastic and others have no business advising anybody on anything. <laughs> and we, ne we haven't had that separation before and there is no way to tell who's who. Yep. And that's the difficulty is how do we move from one to the other? And the regime of having certification, going through training, and actually having a um, regulator who comes down on people who provide bad advice is going to be really important. And I was interested in your comment about life insurance because we know that the only thing that's happened in life insurance in New Zealand is churn. Mm -hmm. That's been great for the advisor and kept for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some, you know, we're moving in the right direction, but some big steps to take because we're talking about developing capability in markets and the advisors having the regulator who is able to do it, but also not creating this massive dislocation where we run out of all advisors. Mm. Um, and I absolutely take your point that we don't want people pretending to be advisors, which does happen absolutely. And life insurance, I think, is a good example of that. Sorry? Oh, yeah, oh, churn. churn. So, you so know, life insurance um, brokers get um, paid to twice your annual fee every time you sign up somebody with a different um, provider? At some companies. At some companies, some more than others. Um, but I guess that's the challenge is uh, what we have seen in the New Zealand market on a per capita basis, the life insurance market hasn't grown um, for a very long time. But yet we see a huge amount of turnover of these policies moving from one provider to another. All that benefits is the advisor in the middle, the customer's not getting a better product, and neither is the industry, the life insurance industry, growing in terms of its size, its sophistication and capability. So I'm going to let Blair think about this before he responds, so he gives some thought to that, that kind of question. But Elaine, you mentioned as well in the UK, advices. What's it like over there? I mean, you've gone through some massive uh, reforms there, particularly around su uh, the superannuation or pension schemes, where now you know those people were originally going to be putting their money into an, uh, an annuity of sorts. Now they're getting a pot of money and they need advice. I mean, what's the environment like there and, uh, and what's the quality like? Well, it's changing, and I think we're waiting to see quite it look, what it looks like. Um, it's not just the UK. In fact, it's across the whole of Europe in relation to investment products. If you want to s describe yourself as an advisor, then you do have to be fully independent. In other words, quite independent of any provider, able to advise from across the marketplace and uh, to offer completely independent advice. You're not uh, 
incentivized through commissions, and in other words, the consumer has to pay for that advice. And I can see a question coming up there. Are you about to ask us that? Or as I shall begin to address it and what I say. The question down here says, if you think there's a need for more independent advice, who's going to pay for it? Um, some consumers can pay for it, and I think this is the big debate that's going on in the UK now. Not everybody can, not everybody will. And if they won't and can't, then who should pay for it? My personal view is that we've gone down the route of saying that uh, debt advice is a collective responsibility of the industry. Therefore, the levy collected by the financial services regulator will be used, part of it, small part of it, will be used to fund a national provision of debt advice. I think we would have less need for debt advice, less need for wholesale um, compensation schemes if a similar um, mechanism was set up to pay for truly independent, generic, certainly generic advice, if not specific product advice yeah. for consumers. So a levy through the industry for those people who can't afford to pay. But others will pay and um, mm. they can get a good service now. Uh, we have a pretty large IFA population that actually do do quite a good job. Yeah. Miles, um, Australia, I mean, they wouldn't be shy in wanting to pay for advice over there, I would have thought. Um, how's that been going and what are the changes that have occurred and how Australians go to get advice, particularly if they've been saving compulsory now for what, 25 years, they must be having some quite significant lump sums to, uh, to be managed. Yeah, um, that's right. Um, certainly our financial advice sector um, has been undergoing some significant changes recently um, and I think it's, you know, we don't yet know what the outcome of those changes will be, I suppose. Um, but certainly um, we've already seen, um, say, through the government's future financial advice reforms, the introduction of a statutory best interest duty. Um, some people might have asked the question, why do you need to put that in a statute if you're an, in an advisory profession? But that, we, we, that is now in the law. Um, and a ban on a, a prospective ban on conflicted remuneration. So but a lot of the issues that we saw in Australia um, around things like Commonwealth financial planning and Storm and so on were commission-driven uh, sales, and so that will no longer be able to happen in Australia. Um, but there's a lot more going on than that. Um, um, we know in Australia about 20% of people use an independent, use and pay for an independent financial advisor. 20, do you say 20%? About 20%. So what are the other 80 doing, and what are they doing? Well, that's a, you know, so for them, um, um, you know, there, there, there may be people, many people who don't need that sort of level of sophisticated financial advice because their financial situation just doesn't require uh, that level of intervention, and that's where certainly we at ASIC, through our Money Smart program, would hope to be able to deliver or provide free and impartial generic financial advice, if you want to use that term, um, to help people with some of their financial decisions. But I think also takes us into a discussion around financial products and the role of default settings and, yep. and so on and so forth. So you actually, for those people who either can't or don't want to or don't need sophisticated financial advice, there are other things that sort of can, can help them sort of manage or, or their finances be managed in a way that sort of will achieve their sort of um, financial goal. Uh, one new sort of um, feature or facility, um, this whole question about bad apples, because we've seen at the regulator instances where the same person turns up um, in different organisations and it had been hard historically to keep track of um, some of these people and they would sort of move through the system and um, reappear and we also knew that some firms weren't necessarily doing, the, 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 well weren't able to perhaps do the level of employment checks or background checks that we would have hoped um, or, or people would have hoped. Um, so we've actually introduced, um, and at an ASIC we never had, um, up until recently, actually a comprehensive record of all the individuals qualified or licensed to give financial advice at an individual level. So we've just um, launched, uh, through, through government regulation, a financial advisor register, which now every individual financial advisor in Australia needs to be on if they're giving personal advice. It's not about the company or the licensee, right. the it's the individual. But what we've done is, so that's a facility for both investors but also for employers to check yeah. who these people are and where they've been, it has their employment history and whether there's been any disciplinary action taken against them. And for the consumer what we've done is this is a sort of a good um, sort of combination I guess of regulatory approaches with education approaches or information approaches. We've combined that with um, 
a whole set of questions to ask a financial advisor if you're dealing with one. Yep. Um, um, and uh, various other sort of uh, tips and links to um, the, the sort of things you should consider when you're choosing an advisor. Um, and this has actually been quite, what we've seen is a very significant increase in the interest and uptake of, as I say, this sort of information around uh, questions to ask, because it actually gives people a tool that they can, having checked, they're in the moment of checking the advisor they're about to deal with or thinking of dealing with, and then we give them a set of questions to ask, and then we with suggested answers or things you should look out for. Good. And I think it's been quite effective. Yeah, no, that's good. And I, I, I hear where you're coming from, I think. Um, you know, that there's mass that doesn't need a lot of advice, they just need good direction or information. And Blair, you, you, you get a, a, a good vision because you've seen what's happening in Australia from, we, from your business perspective, but here in New yeah. Zealand, I mean, before we open the floor to questions, I just wonder if you've got kind of the view where you see advice going in New Zealand and, and how, how we can actually grow it. Uh, well, I'd like to see advice standards across the board lift. So yeah. I think we've made some, some, we've made a great start. Um, I think the, the ability to ask questions is, is fundamental. I regard those as the character questions, uh, not the flashy stuff. So, you know, can you ask the right questions to figure out, uh, is the person in front of me uh, competent, uh, are they conflicted, and, and do they have my best interests at, at heart? Um, but, you know, what I would also say is this is not easy. Um, you know, uh, and the other thing is um, people tend to, uh, I guess, have a view that, um, you know, I can't afford it, therefore someone else should pay. Um, I, I have some challenge with that in respect of the assumption that uh, I don't have money, but when I probe people, they actually have plenty. So, you know, often people say to me, oh, you know, I don't want to pay your advisors. And we obviously have a, we have a model where we, uh, in the investment space, is a fee-for-service model. Um, you know, and an advisor will be you know, looking to charge, say, $1,200 for a, for a plan, and there's a fair bit of work in a proper financial plan. People say, oh, I can't possibly pay that. And I ask them, well, have you got Sky Television? Because that costs about 1200 bucks a year. So you don't want to pony up for some financial advice that is about your future and the protection of the, you and the ones you love, but you want to watch rugby this weekend. Because yeah. that's a simple trade-off. Yeah. They think it's a luxury good. It's, it's getting and so, so the reality is, many more of the population can access advice and pay for it. Because you know, I think we have to recognise advisors uh, aren't a, a charity or a public service. They're trying to obviously you know, survive as well. So you know, it's, it's not an exercise in saying that they uh, need to do this for free. They need to be uh, you know, appropriate. They need to deliver the, the right kind of standards and ethics. Um, but I don't think that's unreasonable um, to expect them to be remunerated. And people can if they choose, invest in that. Um, it's a question of whether they value what that's for. They need to understand it. And look, um, why don't we stop it there? Because we've got a really, and Shimabil, you're gonna, this would be a surprise that this question would come up. Uh, and I'm just reading out here, it says, how big of threat does Greece, this problem is posed to the global economy? Now, hopefully we'll see whether you're gonna be right or wrong later, but what are your thoughts, I mean, generally? How, how big an impact, what's the ripple effect, essentially, that Greece and their worries are going to do for the rest of the world? Yeah, Greece in and of itself is not a problem. 0.06% of global GDP or something, you know, they're tiny. The bigger issue is whether or not the European project fails as a result of this. And if Europe breaks apart, then this will create significant ramifications in terms of global financial market volatility and all of those bits and pieces. So, yes, it's a big risk. And what really matters is whether or not the politicians from the north uh, will pony up essentially to give yet another massive loan to Greece because Greece simply doesn't have money to pay back what it owes. I'm not quite sure what the, well, that means. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so you never get a yes or no from an economist. Mm -hmm. I told you. <laughs> So, uh, Elaine, just I, look, we're virtually running out of time, and I wonder, um, probably from your perspective, if we're looking at what we're going through now from an advisor review process, how we get and give advice in New Zealand, what would be the one message or, or takeaway or thing that we should endeavour to look at doing um, that, from your experience, that will be of most benefit to the consumer? I think you need to look at the way that financial advisors are remunerated and how many of them are paid on commission 
mm. and uh, are incentivized to sell specific products and then ask yourself, is that a good way to be providing financial advice to consumers? And on that note, I'm bang on time. I'm sure it's not oh, yeah, okay. I feel like we've met the panel off a bit lightly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give it a crack. Is there anyone else who loves some? Yes. Ah. <laughs> Gone after being oh, oh. Hi, I'm Bonner from the BNZ. Um, there's a saying that goes, if uh, your neighbour loses his job, then it's a recession. If you lose your job, then it's a depression. And uh, Elaine, I've got one question for you, and that is, um, Rob mentioned that markets are cyclical, there's ups and there's also downturns. And if I, w I wondered if, from your experience, you've seen characteristics or archetypes of communities that have shown themselves to be resilient, so across communities through downturns, and um, Shilabil, I had a question for you as well, and that's with the ageing population, the changing in demographics, um, it's not new to the world um, or New Zealand. Um, is there going to be a shock or a challenge as we have more and more <coughs> retirees for longer? So two questions for you both. Do you want to go first? Okay. Um, yes, I have. And uh, I've actually studied the impact of the global financial crisis on European member states and mm. the populations within them. If we compare Spain and Ireland, they both had huge house price bubbles. Economies based on construction, um, economies based on uh, home loans, basically, and populations that have, in my opinion, taken leave of their senses and mm. what they were paying for houses. Mm. In Ireland, it was catastrophic. I mean, they both needed bailouts, of, of course. The economies did. Um, but for the ordinary members of the uh, ordinary households, in Ireland, mortgage arrears became horrific and remain horrific. Uh, more than a quarter of uh, households are either currently in arrears with their mortgages or have had them restructured. The same problems did not occur in Spain. So to answer your question, what is different? In Ireland, they were consummate borrowers, all of them, right across the generations. In Spain, and to a large degree in Portugal and slightly lesser degree in Italy, in the older population, there's been an incredibly strong savings culture. Mm. There's been no state welfare state, so a very, in Spain and Portugal particularly, a very strong emphasis on the family and family support. Mm. Family support has kept young people afloat, and we've not seen those high levels of arrears um, in Spain, although it's under, it is under strain at the moment. So I think that's one very important lesson I would take away from it. And my conclusion from the work was, that actually the state of household finances and the state of the economy, along with what regulators and governments did to resolve the problem, explained all the outcomes across the European member states. I guess on the second question, in spite of the politics, aging is real, and we are going to have issues with our superannuation and our health costs. Mm. And it will have two big implications, I think. One, for the sector, we have to get used to figuring out how do we do decumulation in a positive way. Mm -hmm. We have no products really in place now that can do it well. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is around what do we do in terms of the young investors who will be coming through, who will be facing an entirely different set of political and economic risks. Because what was guaranteed in previous generations in terms of health care, age care, universal care, those are not going to be sustainable into the future. So we are going to have to find a tiered approach in terms of product innovation and product quality, and I suspect we are going to see a huge amount of disruption in the financial sector, both in terms of products and in terms of advice. And in the interset, I expect to see technology coming through in quite a big way in terms of providing some of that um, solution. Um, and what we're seeing in the UK, for example, with the aggregators being a very, very important part in supporting the industry. It's more about a substitution, or a complement rather than a substitution. But demographics is going to fundamentally change the financial sector, which has been, I think, quite slow moving for quite some time in New Zealand. And we're about to hit a very big demographic push that requires a fundamental rethink, both for the retirees that are coming up, but also for the young people who are going to face very different set of risks and opportunities. All right, we're going to do one more question. Yes.
it's just that Blair mentioned that he thought that there was plenty of room for financial advisor, advisor services to improve in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And apart from the issues of independence, um, do you want to just expand on that and give us your view on what needs to improve? Um, yeah, I think, look, we've got a regime at the moment that allows quite a broad spectrum of people to call themselves advisors. Um, uh, quite a proportion of those really are more salespeople. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, the, the key issues to me are issues of uh, the consistency of disclosure and the transparency of that. So how am I remunerated, um, both hard dollars and soft dollars? Um, and what are the conflicts of interest that exist? Um, what genuinely is the range of products that I sell? Um, not that I say that I sell, but that I sell. Because I've seen advisors who say they've got a, you know, an open product shelf, um, but 97% of their businesses push through one provider. That doesn't feel that open. So, uh, and so uh, th those things are key, I think. Um, the other one I would say is um, the extent to which um, they are making their recommendations based on uh, a genuine understanding of the customer's need and tolerance for volatility um, uh, and, and, and truly understanding that versus um, delivering you a solution based on some uh, product rating or, or data point that purports to be the correct one. Therefore, I'll, I'll just use that as the reason why I make that recommendation. So, you know, good advice uh, needs to probe what really your true needs and goals are and how do you get there. Because that's what a plan is, isn't it? Is to turn a bunch of dreams into, into, into an aspiration and, a, and an outcome. Right. I think that's it because we've got lunch now, is that right? So please uh, join me in thanking our panellists today and contributing to today. Thanks very much.